John says in 1 John 2, verse 17, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Did you hear that? Whoever does the will of God abides forever. And if you are an authentic follower of Jesus Christ, I know that you have a desire, a desire given to you by the Holy Spirit. You have a desire to do the will of God. But as I say that, all of us struggle with knowing the will of God sometimes, and certainly with doing it. And uh, over the years, I found this passage that we're looking at in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, to be of immense help to me, and I'm sure to many of you, and I'm going to challenge you with it today. We're continuing in our study of Romans, and I know some of you think we're going very slowly. After all, we did one verse last week, and we're doing one verse today, but I assure you we're going to speed up at some point. So uh, there we are. Um, as Rodney has said, I get the study guides. It would be good if you worked ahead. The various messages are set out in the order in which I'll preach them. Study it during the week. Try and answer some of the questions, and I think you'll find that very, very helpful. Last Sunday, from verse 1, we saw that we must meet the challenge of a lifetime and present our bodies to God in total commitment. Did you accept that challenge? I know many of you did. I saw you come down here. Others of you stay seated. But I trust even though you were seated, you accepted that challenge. Perhaps you're afraid of the challenge. Perhaps you're not sure of the challenge. Perhaps you thought that that challenge was for someone else. I, I, I was very moved when I saw some of our pastors and some of our elders coming down as if we could never think that we would get beyond this, that we who lead the people of God surely first and foremost must be those who willingly accept this challenge to present our bodies in total commitment to God. If you didn't accept that challenge, I challenge you again today. We're going to read in a moment Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. But having accepted that challenge, it doesn't stop just with accepting a challenge, does it, as we're going to learn uh, today. Are you ready to continue? Do you want me to go into verse 2? Sometimes I think I need to preach last Sunday's message again. Some of you may not have, not have got it. Some of you perhaps were asleep. Some of you had hardened hearts. Some of you thought this was for someone else. So I ask you again, did you accept the challenge to present your bodies as a total commitment to God? I'm asking you to do that. Now, if you're ready to continue, and we've got someone clapping, which is very encouraging. <laughs> I'd rather have that than some of the solemn faces that some of you have. Are you ready to discern the will of God for your life and to do it? Paul says, if you are, there are two commands that we're going to look at and are going to observe. But let's stand first and read these wonderful verses, these foundational verses, these verses which are the pivot from the first 11 chapters of Romans which present the doctrinal basis, and now Paul is dealing with the practical implications of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and he sets the case. He, he gives us this challenge, this pivotal challenge in these verses. Will you read it with me, please? Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Please be seated. Two commands. First is the negative, don't conform. I hope you've got your Bibles there. Turn with me to Romans 12, and notice verse 2, how it begins. Here is the negative, do not be conformed to this world. The command is very clear, don't conform to the world. 
If you're going to present your body as a living sacrifice to God in an act of total commitment, if you're really serious about discerning and knowing the will of God, this is of utmost importance. You must not conform to the world. You must be a non-conformist. When I was a young teenager, I was officially given the title of non-conformist. That wasn't just because of my behavior, but uh, I went to school in Gibraltar, Gibraltar Grammar School, and uh, for three years between 13 and 16. And uh, the school uh, was taught by a Roman Catholic order called Christian Brothers. Some of you know them. We to call them brother so-and-so. They wore a little dog collar. And uh, most, they were, the teachers were all uh, Roman Catholics, obviously, and the vast majority of the boys, it was a boys-only school, were Roman Catholics. Uh, there were a few exceptions. Uh, two of my classmates were Jewish, and a couple were Anglican. And then there was myself and another boy uh, who was totally irreligious, um, as far as I could discern, and we were given the tag as non-conformists. We didn't fit the pattern. We didn't fit the mold. They really didn't know what to do with us. It was a majority of a Roman Catholic. They understood there were a few Jewish boys, a couple of Anglican. After all, this was the British system of education. We were going to do the Cambridge University entrance exams. And what about Monroe? What about this other boy, Alan Ruff? We were called non-conformists. So in their religious education, uh, my Jewish friends and uh, myself, we were excused, which was very, very acceptable, obviously. And uh, we left school. We were non-conformists. Being a follower of Jesus means that you are to be a non-conformist. You are to be different. Being a follower of Jesus requires saying no to many things. Now, I know that's not popular. We're told today that everything's to be positive. We're to be great positive thinkers and possibility thinkers and tell ourselves that we can do anything we like as long as we believe in it. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, do not be conformed to the world. In fact, Paul is presenting two value systems, two standards which are diametrically opposed. And if you understand the Gospels, is very true to the teaching of Jesus because do you remember Jesus as he called people to him? He said, If you want to follow me, you must first deny self. No to self, no to the world. And the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of Paul doesn't fit us very well today in our cultural Christianity because it is very clear from the teaching of the New Testament, as we have laid out here at the beginning of Romans chapter 12, that you're either following Christ or you're conforming to the world. Jesus himself said, you can't serve two masters. Now, we like to think we can. We want to have and say, yes, I'm following Jesus, but we also want to have, as it were, a foot in the world. We want to live between them both. Sometimes we're followers of Jesus. Sometimes we're just following the world and conforming to the world. And Paul said, that is not the way to go at all. You can't do it. Jesus said that. Make up your mind. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But don't sit on the fence. Don't halt between two opinions, one of the Old Testament characters said. You're either committed to God or you're being conformed to the world. Now, I don't answer too quickly, but what is it in your case? How do you think, as God looks down in your heart and your life, would He say that you are committed to Him and you're a true follower of Christ? I don't mean perfect. We all fail. Pastor Hathaway led us in a prayer of confession. I'm not asking if you're perfect. I know you're not. But I'm asking, are you an authentic follower of Jesus Christ? Or whatever you say about yourself, the reality is you're conforming to the world. This word conform means to mold or to form after something. What does the text say? Do not be conformed to this world. Now, 
The Greek word for the world here is not cosmos, the normal one. It refers to the age. Paul is saying, I don't want you to be conformed to the age, to the times, to the value system around you, to the surrounding culture. He's talking to Romans living in pagan Rome. J.B. Phillips, in his famous paraphrase, says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Are you being squeezed by the world into its mold? Are you? That's a very convicting question, isn't it? Don't allow the fleeting value systems, the agenda, the attitudes, the mindset of the world to conform you to this mold. Being a Christian is counter-cultural. You know, this negative command, and it is a negative, don't be conformed, it is in the present tense. Maybe that's not obvious in English, in our English translation, but it's in the present tense. The point is that the basic and the continuous rule of our lives is non-conformity. As I say, Christianity is counter-cultural. The early disciples turned the world upside down. So as I follow Jesus Christ, I realized I'm being pulled, I'm being squeezed to conform, to be like everyone else, to go with the flow, to fit in, and to adopt the ideas the values, the trends, the mindset of our surrounding culture. And our surrounding culture in the 21st century is a very strong one with our media, with our social media, with our global world. It is so easy, isn't it, to just go along with the trend of the world, the thinking of the world. But we've learned in our study of Romans that we are different, that we belong not to this world, we belong to a future age the age which is to come, the kingdom of God, and that with the coming of our Savior, the kingdom of God has come, and we are to follow Christ, and I'm not to be conformed to the world. You conforming to any molds? You being squeezed into a particular mold? What about the mold of pleasure? Going for the gusto. You're a bit of a party animal. If something feels good, you do it. Can I ask you, with God's grace, to break that mold? One by conforming to the mold of materialism. Your life centers around, and in a very real sense, is controlled by money and possessions, by the stuff that you have. Some of us were saying, if you notice all the storage units going up in, in Charlotte, I realize there's a lot of people coming and going. I'm not against storage units. But isn't it the reality that some of us have so much stuff, even though we live in pretty large houses, it can't contain all of our stuff, so we've got to put it in storage. Do you think, what, what does that mean? all this stuff that we have. Are you allowing meaning in life, your own value, your own significance to be defined by what you have, by your financial status? Don't allow yourself to be squeezed into the mold of materialism. That is a very, very strong force, isn't it? break that mold. I heard of one Christian businessman whose warehouse burned down, and when a friend expressed concern, the businessman replied, young man, I gave my business to the Lord 20 years ago. If he wants to burn down his own warehouse, it's all right. Let's go and have a cup of coffee. I don't know if I could say that if my house burned down saying, well, it belongs to the Lord anyhow, but isn't it true? Isn't it true that everything you have, a warehouse, a business, a car, a house, clothes, everything that we have comes from God. And that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And although we say, yes, we believe that, 
Isn't it so easy to allow the culture of materialism, of grasping everything, and of being so selfish and of so self-centered that all we're concerned about is ourself? Break that mold. Do not be conformed to the world. Here's another mold, the, the mold of self-fulfillment. It's a common belief that God wants me happy all the time. I come to church so I can feel happy all the time. The mold of self-fulfillment, of narcissism, of popularity. This is the society of the selfie, isn't it? I mean, when you put your photo on Instagram or whatever it is, how many likes do you get? It's all about you, isn't it? And if you get more than me, I'm really ticked off. <laughs> many, many molds. What is it in your life? It may be none of these things. But what do you find yourself being squeezed into it? Don't be conformed to the world. Many molds, many mindsets, worldviews, pressures on us, and God is calling us to be different to be countercultural, to be nonconformist. Do not be conformed to the world. Don't live your life like the unbeliever next door. You're to be totally committed to follow Jesus. So how are we doing? Commitment to Jesus or conformity to the world? Now let's look at the positive. Paul hasn't finished. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Here's the positive. Be transformed. I love this. The command is to be transformed. We're in the transformation business. This is authentic Christianity. J.B. Phillips says, let God remold your minds from within. Inner transformation. Now, the Greek word translated here, transformed, is the word from which we get our English word, metamorphosis. Do not be conformed to this world, but go through a metamorphosis by the renewal of your mind. We know what metamorphosis is, don't we? When I was a little boy, we would collect the uh, spawn from the frogs. We go to the little uh, burdens or, or creeks, as you would call them here, uh, the little rivers, put this in a pail, and much to our mother's disgust, we'd bring it home, and uh, we would watch the metamorphosis. We would want to become little tadpoles. And after a bit, the little tadpoles, it swims around. In many cases, they died. Could never work out what they really wanted to eat. Um, but occasionally, you would see the little legs growing on the tadpole, and over time, you have a tiny frog. What's happened? A metamorphosis, a change has taken place. Here is another one uh, with a caterpillar away on the left. There is a very ugly caterpillar. And here, in the wisdom of God and the creativity of God, a metamorphosis takes place, a transformation. Notice it is a process, both with the frog and with the butterfly. It takes time. There are stages. And yet from that ugly caterpillar comes this beautiful, magnificent butterfly. That little caterpillar that just crawls around and is such an ugly little thing is transformed into a beautiful, majestic butterfly that really can fly wherever it wants. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> that God is going to work in our lives and do a metamorphosis, a transformation which is radical in nature and is also to be continuous in our life because this is also present tense. Don't be conformed. Make sure day by day you're not being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is not some religious performance. 
This is not some program that you adopt. This is radical in nature, spiritual transformation. Paul is contrasting then wonderfully conformity to the world with spiritual transformation. The transformation has its emphasis not so much on the external, that's conformity, but the emphasis on that which is internal, on that which is spiritual. Oh, in our religion, in our cultural Christianity, there's often a great emphasis on the external. But Paul is talking about that which is internal, that which is inward, inward transformation, not outward conformity, not playing a part, but this is radical, revolutionary change that Paul is expecting from followers of Jesus. Now, this is very key. Don't miss this. This transformation is supernatural. It is supernatural. The, the verb transformed is in the present tense because Paul is emphasizing the progressive process of the transformation. As I said, in nature, the metamorphosis doesn't take place overnight. That little tadpole doesn't become a frog overnight. There is a process. So it is with us as we begin to follow Christ, as we accept this challenge of total commitment over the days, over the weeks, over the months, indeed over the years, there is a beautiful spiritual transformation in our lives. As a pastor, that's one of my greatest joys. I've been here 13 years, and it's wonderful <coughs> to see someone come to Christ and begin to grow with a change from their own life. Here's a man who had a very dirty mouth, very harsh with his family, very angry man, for whatever the reason, and he comes to Jesus Christ. And Jesus never leaves us where we were, but begins this wonderful process of transformation. Oh yes, salvation is instantaneous. We go in a moment from spiritual death to spiritual life. In a moment, all of our sins are washed away. Ah, but this process of becoming like Jesus takes time, doesn't it? And you have seen, I trust you've seen in your own life and the lives of those around you, this spiritual transformation. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. You're in Romans. Next book is 1 Corinthians, then 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, where Paul talks about this transformation, uses the same uh, Greek word, metamorpho. Here it is, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. He's talked about the difference in the Old Covenant and New Covenant as the context. And we all, he says, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. Have you ever beheld the glory of the Lord? Notice this, are being transformed. There's our word, same word. This metamorphosis are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Here is the wonderful supernatural process as we begin to follow Jesus Christ, that the more we look at Christ and the more we love Christ, the more we become like Him. And so over the months, over the years, as we focus on Christ, as we follow Christ, as we say no to the world, and we become less and less worldly in our thinking and in our actions, and we become more and more like Jesus. Paul referred to that, didn't he, in Romans chapter 8, about us being conformed. God is conforming us to the image of His Son. Do you spend time looking at Jesus? Tonight we're going to break bread perhaps in the greatest way on this earth that we can look at our Savior. What does He say? The Lord, as He institutes 
the Lord's Supper, this do in remembrance of me. You don't come to the Lord's Supper just to look at yourself. Yes, there's to be self-examination, that is true. But having confessed our sins before the Lord, our focus is not so much on one another. It is on the beauty of the Lord Jesus. We remember Him, and as we're remembering Him, God does a remarkable, a supernatural work in our hearts and in our lives. We become more and more like Jesus. Isn't it wonderful being a follower of Christ? <laughs> now, this verb, if you notice, be transformed is passive. So we could translate it, let yourselves be transformed. Let and continue to let yourselves be transformed is the point. The transformation is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer, but as well as it being a passive, it is a command. It's an imperative. Notice what Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but command, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You say, well, if God is doing it, what, what am I to do? You have a responsibility to be transformed. You have a responsibility not to be conformed to the world, and you are to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's at work in your life, praying for a humble heart, praying that you will not be conformed to this world, asking God for this supernatural transformation in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, that God is there, and God will give us all of the help we can. And I'm to look at Jesus and the more I look at Jesus and the more I humble myself before Him and cry out to Him for help, more and more I'm being transf transformed from one degree of glory to another, that we become more and more like Jesus. One of our themes for 2019 is displaying and proclaiming the Lord Jesus with grace and truth. But it is first to display Christ. So that as people look at you, they see something of Jesus in you. This is the spiritual transformation. Are you seeking that? Have you got into a rut? Are you seeking for the spiritual transformation in your own life, in your family, in your marriage, your relationships? God will help you. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, how is this transformation done? It is, says Paul, by the renewal of your mind. This is of crucial importance. And it is at this point I think many of us fail. The Christian life is not some mindless mysticism. It's not some emotional hype where we just say, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's not some kind of activism either. No, our mind is very, very important. It is the very center of our intellectual and moral life. Today's culture often bypasses the mind. We're told, just have an experience. Some churches advertise that, just come and have an experience. Well, there's all kinds of experiences, aren't there? Some are good and some are bad. Uh, Follow your gut, you're told. Always trust your feelings. How's that for really lousy advice? Think with your heart. Really? My heart's deceitful and desperately wicked. And I think yours is the same. That's not what Paul says. Trust your instincts. Always just go, just what you feel like, man. And if you disagree with me, I'm going to say that's my perceptions. Well, maybe you need to change your perceptions if they're not based in reality. But we have a society more and more that has lost the capacity to think. This is very, very dangerous, and is the very opposite of what Paul is saying. Notice what he's saying. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, your thinking capacity. Not some emotional experience Paul is arguing. 
Of course, the Christian life affects our emotions, but this transformation begins with the renewal of our minds. The Greek philosopher of the first century, Epictetus, wrote, what really frightens and dismays us is not external events themselves, but the way in which we think about them. It's not things that disturb us, but our interpretation of their significance. I came across this quote, and I thought, you know, he wasn't a believer. Uh, I think he was born in, in uh, Turkey, and then uh, it was in Greece as well. But he's a Greek philosopher, smart guy. Um, and notice what he says. It's not things that disturb us, but our interpretation, the way we think about them, of their significance. Hannah Holborn Gray, the president of the University of Chicago from 1978 to 1993, said, education should not, as far as I know, she wasn't a believer, but I think what she said is very good. Hannah Holborn Gray, education should not be intended to make people comfortable. It is meant to make them think. We've got away from that, I think, in our education so much, haven't we? I've told you before, in my first class at Edinburgh University, as we began our legal studies, our professors stood there, welcomed us, 150 of us. We thought we were the bee's knees because we'd arrived at Edinburgh University and were admitted to study law. We thought we were a pretty smart bunch. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have no problem doing your legal studies at Edinburgh University if you can do these three things. One, read. We think, of course we could read. <laughs> Secondly, write. They were going to teach us not only to read, but to comprehend. To write, the ability to write concisely and precisely, a very, very important skill, isn't it? Third, he said, to think. To think. And we thought at the time, really? <laughs> of course we can read. Of course we can write. Of course we can think. But he was saying something very, very profound, that they, during our education, as we studied law, were going to help us to think as lawyers, with precision, concisely. But many college campuses today, students are not being taught how to think. They're being taught to trust their own feelings and not to interact with views with which they disagree. What does Paul say about the mind? Remember he tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 that our minds are blinded by the God of this age. Who's the God of this age? Satan has blinded our minds, but the glorious light of the gospel is seen in the face of Jesus Christ, gives illumination. The light of the Word of God comes into dark hearts, bringing illumination, bringing conviction, bringing transformation. And this way of thinking, this spiritual transformation is a process. You want instant spirituality? You think there's some spiritual key, some spiritual secret, some little technique, some one, two, three, four, five little principles that are going to turn you overnight into a super spiritual Christian with no more problems, that's a delusion. This is the way. Have your minds renewed. We are to think, we are to act in a spiritual way about life. Not the worldly thinking of the culture around us, but as Paul would say to the Christians at Philippi in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is the reorientation of our thoughts and our will. Our whole mental outlook is being renewed and restored as we bring every thought captive to obey Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. What you see, what you read, what you watch, what you think about is crucial to the way we live. How is this done, this transformation? By the renewal of our mind. Your mind matters. Be careful what you allow into your mind, what you see, what you hear, 
what you think about that is critical in this process of spiritual transformation. Now, how is this done? Do you need me to remind you? You need to know and apply the Word of God. The renewed mind is saturated by and controlled by the Word of God. We are bombarded by all kinds of voices, by all kinds of ideas, by all kinds of trends, and uh, therefore we adopt that thinking and we, be, we end up being conformed to the world. No. We're to listen to God as we read His Word, a mind renewed by the Word of God. I referred to these verses last Sunday night as we talked about David and the Word of God. Let me read two of them. Let me read a passage to you from Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your Word. That's it. That's it. You go by the Word of God and you live a clean life. Is it possible for a young man to go to UNC Chapel Hill and to live for God and not to be conformed to the world? Absolutely. If you live according to the Word with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, I have stored up, I've treasured your Word in my heart. I might not sin against you. How, can I, how will I know about sin? How will I be able to resist the temptations of the world out there? Have the Word of God in your heart. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the ways of your testimonies I delight, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways, not on the world. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Verse 18, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. What does this mean about being transformed by the renewal of your mind? Lord, open my eyes to all that is evil around me and all that is wonderful in your word, in the gospel, in Christ. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 17 on this subject as well. John 17 is what we call the high priestly prayer. Jesus says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The Christian is not of this world. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. What does that mean, sanctify them? Sanctification, Romans 6, to set apart, to become holy. How are you going to become holy? Sanctify them, says Jesus, in the truth. Where's the truth? Jesus tells us, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be consecrated in truth. How am I going to resist the world? How am I going to be transformed, set apart, so that I'm living for Christ by the Word of God? Are you daily in the Word of God? You said you were going to read your Bible every day on January 1, and you've already stopped. You daily in the Word of God? You serious about it? You're going to be part of a life group? You say, ah, I don't know, coming one hour to church is enough. What about after this service, going to one of our life groups with fellow believers to discuss your Word? I've been invited to Pathfinders today. Somebody said, what are you teaching? I said, I'm teaching the Bible right? In a Bible study, serious about the Word of God. Now, notice what happens. Notice what happens to the man, to the woman who is not conformed to the world, but is being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Verse 2 again, 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I know you want to do God's will. I know you want to live a life to the glory of God if you're a follower of Jesus. This is how it becomes. No to the world, yes to the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, so that my mind is being renewed by the Word of God, and so then I'm able to discern what the will of God for me is, knowing it is good, and it is acceptable, and it is perfect. If you are neglecting the Word of God, if you find the Bible is boring, as an evidence that you're conformed to the world and that you are not being transformed by the renewal of your mind. You're either being transformed by the renewal of your mind or you're being conformed to the world. And so the goal is to know and to do God's will. David Livingston was asked if he didn't fear that going into Africa was too dark and difficult. He responded, I'm immortal until the will of God for me is accomplished. That's the voice of a man who knew about this spiritual transformation. This is the goal, isn't it? To discern by testing, I may discern what is the will of God. This word discern means to put to the test, to examine, to prove by testing. Only a mind which is being renewed by the Word of God is able to discern God's will, and not just to know the will of God, but to obey the will of God in practice. I believe, I think you do, that God's will for your life is good. Is it better than your will? Acceptable? Acceptable to God, certainly but also acceptable to me. I want to please God, and it's perfect. Your own will is far from perfect. You have made, and I have made, some bad decisions in life. And But why is it that some followers of Christ continue to make one foolish decision after another? And then they say, well, I don't know what to do. I'm confused. No wonder you're confused. You're listening to the world, you're conformed to the world, and you have not disciplined yourself to get alone with God and to ask the Spirit of God to do this wonderful act of spiritual transformation in your life as you read this book. The more you read this book, the more you'll become like Jesus Christ and there'll be a spiritual transformation going on in your life so that when you are faced with decisions, and all of us face decisions, when you and I are faced with these decisions then, we'll be able to discern the will of God, that you're thinking with a godly mindset. You're thinking with the very mind of Christ, that you've shut out these voices of the world, that bad advice. Shut out listening to these sinful desires and listening to God and have the ability through the work of the Spirit of God as, he, as you read the Word of God to discern that the will of God for you is good and acceptable and perfect. You want God's will for your life? I have to ask you, do you know the guide? Do you know God? You say, how can I know God? There's only one way to know God, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And Christ comes to save us so that you can know God. So then that you know God's will for your life, and not only know it, have the supernatural ability to do it, so that your life is not conformed to the world, but transformed by the work of the Spirit. As we go, here are some questions, very quickly, that I want you to grapple with. They're tough questions. I want you to listen to them humbly, prayerfully, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you areas of sin, worldliness, conformity to the world. Are you ready? Are you feeding your mind with trashy movies, 
violent video games, pornography, junk, or with the Word of God? Here's another one. Are you more concerned about being cool than being like Christ? Are you more concerned with what people think about you than what God thinks of you? When you spend time with non-Christians, are you a different person than when you're with followers of Christ? Is your tolerance level so high that you're hardly ever offended by anything you read, hear, or see? You think you're so sophisticated, but your tolerance is gone. You've been so conformed to the world that you're just like an unbeliever. Here's another one. Are you indulging in sinful practices which leave you feeling guilty and hypocritical? How would you answer that one? In your house, closet, attic, garage, is it so cluttered with stuff that, stuff that you hardly ever use or need? You won't give it away, and you continue to buy more and more stuff. That's a convicting one, isn't it? Are you giving at least a tithe of your income to the Lord? You've seen a bumper sticker, if you love Jesus, tithe. Anyone can blow their horn. <laughs> You're saying, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, yes, you love Jesus. Yeah. What portion of your income did you give to the Lord last year? Transformation leads to generosity, doesn't it? When dealing with issues such as abortion, homosexuality, feminism, and race, do you think of these issues from a secular viewpoint or from a biblical viewpoint? Do you come to Calvary Church primarily for your needs to be met, or do you come to meet God, to learn God's Word, to fellowship, to obey God, and to serve Him? Paul has begun this epistle in Romans by saying that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Have you experienced that power in your life? In coming to Christ and knowing the wonder of your sins being forgiven? Have you experienced that power? Have you experienced the power of this continuous transformation of saying no to the world and saying yes to the Holy Spirit? Come Holy Spirit, and do your supernatural work of spiritual transformation in my heart, in my life, in my very mind, so that my mind is renewed. And as I open the Word of God, it is my greatest delight, because here is the will of God. Here God speaks to me, not just getting alone and listening to any voice. No, but by listening to God who's given us His Word. And so that when the decisions of life come to me and to you, you will know the right thing to do because you are committed to Christ. You're not conformed to the world, and you're tra being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Father, help us. I pray for my brothers and sisters here all of us here are convicted. Your Word exposes our shallowness, our compromise in so many areas, but we thank You that Your Holy Spirit is alive. May Your Spirit be convicting us so that more and more we will say no to the world and more and more say yes to Jesus. And so we pray, take my life and let it be holy, consecrated, Lord, to you. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.